Saludos a toda la afición de Lucha Libre Online. En este que les hable es Michael Morales Torres, integrante del equipo de Lucha Libre Online. Gente, y tenemos el enorme privilegio de presentarles a nuestro invitado especial en la tarde de hoy. De Nueva York para el mundo, uno de los personajes más característicos dentro de la vieja escuela de la WWF. Muchas personas llevan años buscándolo a ver dónde rayos ha estado, pero aquí está con nosotros el Lucha Libre Online, actor, comediante, personalidad en cámara de WWF y amante de la vida, quien un día fuese conocido como Jameson Winger, hoy John. Uh, DJ Como llega aquí a Lucha Libre Online. John, it is an honor, man, to have you here as our guest. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I got a message. I got to clear because I can't see you. That's okay, oh, sir. Got it. Okay. One second. Ufa. Okay. Here I am. Hey, thanks for having me. Man, it's been a pleasure for us to have you. When we were contacted initially to do this, I was like, this is the guy we've been looking for like a year and a half ago when nobody knew where yeah. he was, where was Jameson. Let's start from the beginning like who is john the human being and how did he got involved into the wrestling industry yeah okay um i was uh on uh, i was in the financial world a lot of wall street a lot of stuff i i grew up right outside new york city born in brooklyn um and i uh out of college was like a financial guy i was designing pension plans, all, all like boring stuff. And um, I just was not loving life. And, and people were telling me for years, growing up, you, you're going to be a stand-up comic when you grow up. You're going to be. And that's what I, I did. I left that business. I had some money put away and decided to go do stand-up. And very early on, I got involved in this improvisation show and Vince McMahon was in the audience one night and I recognized him because it was, it was some scripted scenes, but a lot of it was improv and it was very, um, uh, what's the word intimate in that there were six dining rooms where this went on and Even though there were 150 people there, there were only maybe 25 in Vince's room having dinner with the show. That's what it was. It was a, a dinner theater kind of thing. And my strength was definitely not acting. I never had any desire to be an actor. Um, my thing at that time was comedy and improv is, has a lot to do with that. And I just recognized him immediately. And... Um, during my improv segments, realized he was like hysterical laughing and beat red. And um, when the show ended, after we, you know, get dressed, um, I came out looking for Vince just to say hello, thinking that, wow, you know, he really, I know he liked me. Um, just want to go say hello to somebody famous. And I wasn't a wrestling fan, but I knew who Vince was because it was at a time where it was, you know, several years after Vince took over the company, all that Cindy Lauper, MTV stuff. He was a, a well-known face. And I went up to him, introduced myself. He told me what a great show it was, but he wasn't engaging, like wanted to continue the conversation any more than that. Um, And I was okay, but like, you know, with, with thoughts, wow, wouldn't it be great to go work for Vince? Um, and then Sunday, this was a Saturday night. Um, then Sunday came and I woke up thinking about it and probably had some thoughts about it during that day. But by the time Monday morning rolled around, I was back thinking about what's my week going to be like, kind of, it kind of left my mind. And sure enough, Vince or WWF called the theater to say, how can we get in touch with the actor that played Jameson? And they hooked me up and Vince wanted me to come in that day, that Monday. And when I got there, he said, look, don't break character. Come in. We're going to introduce you to Bobby Heenan. We need a co-host for the Bobby Heenan show. Um, 
we need somebody that can go toe to toe with Bobby because he's he was such an improvisational genius that, you know, Gorilla was great working with him and and Mean Gene Oakland was great. But Bobby definitely dominated those guys, like in terms of improvisate. There was never a script. So. Um, so I go in and and. Uh, Bobby, they introduced me to Bobby and I, I was totally Jameson. Um, and I know he was giving me some weird looks, but we had a lot of great give and take. And, and uh, you know, by the time we finished, there was, they presented me with paperwork, a contract oh, um, to be the co-host. Like Vince loved it. Everybody was in the room. Everybody was laughing. Everybody was like, uh, the whole writing team was, there and the writer by the way very rarely for some of the personalities for some of the talent they wrote scripted lines for promos and stuff like that to do but i never nobody ever gave or bobby for that matter that i saw um ever put a script in front of us it was just right down to the opening night you know that that first episode um they booked these, I don't know if you're familiar with the show or, or your listeners are, um, but from that first show, it was just, they booked these crazy guests, like an 80 year old stripper, a guy who whistled through his nose, songs really great, like, yeah. like a, a, a painter who did uh, these, you know, great landscape paintings in like, seven minutes like a world record where he could um it was just crazy it was a mother daughter stand-up team they were horrible but that was the comedy behind it they had a hooker uh they had a uh, uh a porn star they had uh it was just it, it was a lot of fun and and bobby you know definitely felt comfortable with me because as much as i was able to hold my own with him he also appreciated how I fed him stuff where he could, um, you know, win that battle or like, he loved that I could feed him funny stuff to, to react to. And it was like a match made in heaven. And the, the uh, support of the wrestling fan community for that show was overwhelming. People loved it. But USA, who that was the network that Monday night pr prime time was on canceled us after four weeks, four episodes. And Vince was like, wow, I, 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 I got to hold on to this guy. What can we do? So they just made me like an audience plant um, for prime time. It was a studio show. It was, it was like a talk show. There was, you know, Vince and Bobby or Bobby and Mean Gene or Sean Mooney was there then. Um, it was different. They alternated the host, but they always stuck me in the audience. And every episode, um, every episode was Jameson getting in trouble with a heel and being rescued by a good guy. And yeah, you know, I... I know I got a lot of fan mail and all that stuff, but I never appreciated at the moment it was all happening. Never really appreciated how many fans I had, how many people love Jameson. I, I, I get messages to this day from wrestling fans, not just in this country, around the world that tell me um, how much they appreciate. I had no idea. I know I wanted to move on. I, I, I um, went after the Royal Rumble. When I find when I left, um, I started an acting career. I was, I was getting calls for auditions, calls from agents and and stuff just by appearing on all the the WWF stuff, um, and kind of fell in love with acting and and. Um, then started to write. I wrote a play that went off Broadway. Um, 
uh, wrote a one act that won a couple of awards. I was like, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And all that time, if I would have known what I know now or what I knew 10 years ago, may have tried it to hang on there. Um, but I was kind of over it because there was no more prime time and they were sticking me on the, on the road. And I, I was giving up a lot of acting work to go, um, you know, on these tours where, where, uh, when they made me the Bushwhackers manager, that was the, that was the, that was the deal for a year plus was kind of leading up to Royal where, where I, as an audience plant at the live events, um, how the Bushwhackers, you know, saved me from the yeah, bad guys. And I became their mascot at first and then became their manager leading up to that list. It was a great run. I, I, I wish I enjoyed my time there as much as I enjoy looking back on it because it was, it was some really good stuff and some really good relationships that I, I, I kicked myself that I had no idea the power of wrestling fans or the love of wrestling fans um, until I was gone 20 years or 15 years. I'm gone 30 years now, almost. Man, you had an incredible career. Let me translate this briefly to Spanish. Go, to Spanish go, speaking go. audience. Eh, John nos cuenta como todo inicia y él estaba trabajando en un stand-up comedy eh, con el su personaje Jameson y de momento Vince estaba en la audiencia y él empezó a reírse Vince comenzó a reírse drásticamente por lo que Jameson estaba haciendo en la comedia en los ojos los lacrimosos y Jameson dice como que mira yo me cambio de ropa en el camerino y quiero bajar no porque esté buscando trabajo sino yo sé quién es Vince McMahon él tomó control de WWE hace poco y por conocer a alguien famoso como que mira vamos a, a conocerlo a saludarlo y a apreciar su trabajo los saludos, se conocen, establecen conversaciones y WWF lo contacta a él para que llegue ese mismo lunes a Raw. Ese mismo lunes él tenía que estar en Raw y cambió todo completamente, llega directamente allá y le lanzan esta idea para que él tenga una conversación con Bobby de Brain Heenan y no puede romper el personaje, siempre tiene que estar en personaje de Jameson, lo que lo hace bastante interesante. Eh, Jameson menciona que Bobby de Brain Heenan Tenía personalidades como Gorilla Monsoon o Min Jin, pero pues, Bobby de Virginia en cuanto al arte de la improvisación los dominaba. Y ellos querían algo que se la pusiera difícil a él, en donde tuvieran buena química, en donde trabajaran constantemente. Y de una cosa lleva a la otra. Eh, tienen cuatro shows en USA Network. En aquel momento la cadena decide remover el, el piloto. A él lo presentaron en el 89 en el primer episodio. Y Vince no quería sacarlo, dice como que yo quiero quedarme con este tipo, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Pues hacer lo mismo, pero para el programa que era Monday Night eh, Primetime, si no me equivoco, era el nombre que tenía eh, similar a, a lo que hay ahora, que eventualmente se convierte en Raw, también en la cadena USA, y era básicamente en donde Jameson toda la semana se metía en algún problema con algún heel y era salvado por un babyface. Lo que entonces lleva al próximo punto, y dice como que mira, yo hubiese deseado apreciar más el tiempo Mientras estaba allí, todavía recibo cartas de los fanáticos, todavía lo recuerdo con mucho cariño 30 años después. Fue una etapa bonita, pero posterior a eso, él escribe una obra para Broadway, y escribe diferentes tantos comedies, entre muchísimas otras cosas que ha hecho durante su ilustre carrera. Uh, man, you mentioned various topics that are, that are incredible here, in terms of man, what a story, the way you met Vince McMahon. How was your relationship with Vince, him being a supporter of Jameson? It was really good. I mean, you know, Vince has got, you know, over the years, some, some, a little bit of bad publicity by guys that, um, and this is not a secret. It's not like I'm uh, saying anything new, but there were some relationships he had and lost over the years where people badmouthed him. But I got to tell you, He and I and I witnessed some things where uh, I was happy I wasn't the guy Vince was burying at the time, um, but he was always really generous and really good to me. Um, so and I don't like to judge other than how people treat me. And he was 
a gentleman, generous. Um, and and it, it even got to the point, and I knew he thought I was funny. I don't have that, you know, uh, worldwide like that, that kind of comedy style that everybody thinks I'm funny. But the people think that think I'm funny think I'm really funny. And Vince was one of those guys that would just, I could crack him up with an expression. I could, and um, it, it actually, and Hulk Hogan was kind of the same way with me. He loved me. He just thought I was so funny. And it was a nice um, break away from the dramatics of, of professional wrestling, that it was the nice alternative for the fans. And, um, and when I did, I only did three tours with them, but I, I'll never forget this. We were doing a tour in Texas and I'm going to guess this is 1991 where we were at a gig and uh, in, in Texas, one of the Texas stops and after the after the show and and everybody went out afterwards this was just before the steroid Scandal. controversy and the sexual harassment lawsuits that were exposed in playboy um and it was wild guys were we would go out after these shows and a lot of drinking drugging um and you should go into strip joints and you know there were when when things got really out of hand it was they were moving tables around and they were wrestling they were fighting you know drunk wrestlers were and i remember one night in particular hulk hogan and vince mcmahon were actually arguing over whose van they were the drivers or, well, I don't think Hulk was driving, but Vince was driving his van were whose, whose van Jameson was riding in. I'm taking Jameson. No, 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 no. I got Jameson. And like, and it was like, you know, it was, and, and not all the wrestlers felt the same way about me. Um, there were guys that just thought I was, just like some of the old school that just thought I was, what a dick I was. And I wasn't, I mean, I was, you know, maybe you didn't like my character, but as a person, I was, I was cool. I was never, um, you know, when they, these, when tables were flying in these bars, I was, I was like further the first, in fact, some of the tours that we did some nights, I was trying to sneak out of the, the venue. Um, after I was done, before the night came to a close and they were all going up because I, I wasn't a drinker. I wasn't, I, I was a pot smoker and I would sneak back to the hotel, smoke a joint and go watch, you know, Monday Night Football or, you know, whatever was on. Like, I didn't really want to be there. Um, well, that's a lot you have to interpret. No, man, you can continue. Well, that's it. I mean, I, I had... Vince was great to me. Always was. Perfect, man. Let me translate this to Spanish. Él cuenta y habla right. un poco de la relación con Vince McMahon. Fue excelente. Ellos se llevaban bien. Había este cariño, vamos a decirlo de esta manera, eh, donde todo el mundo se peleaba por quién demonios iba a estar con Jameson. Por ejemplo, eh, llega el momento en que Hulk Hogan y Vince eran muy, muy amigos y muy fanáticos del trabajo de él. Y Vince guiaba una camioneta con un grupo. Hulk Hogan guiaba otra camioneta con otro grupo y tocaba elegir quién se iba a llevar a Jameson a la parte de atrás. No, yo quiero a Jameson. No, yo quiero a Jameson. Y se peleaba. Pero había otra gente que, pues, no tenía una muy buena relación con él porque, ah, este tipo es un arrogante, que esto, que si lo otro. Eh, pero es algo bien interesante porque él menciona que antes de todo esto, ellos salían todos. Salían a darse dos o tres cervecitas, a utilizar su marihuana de vez en cuando, un cigarrillito, a strip clubs, a pasarla bien. Y de momento eh, siempre se formaba algún desmadre con los luchadores. Bueno, obviamente luchadores en todos sus hype. Y veían las mesas volando y veían las sillas volando por todos lados. Eh, siempre se armaba un desmadre. Y él, como dice, eh, tenía muy buena relación, siempre lo respaldó. Eh, pero no le encantaba mucho ese ambiente 
él sí le gustaba su cigarrillito de marihuana eh, de vez en cuando eh, a la parte de atrás de un hotel, ver el fútbol por los lunes por la noche, pero como que no era, no era mucho su ambiente. Eh, esto obviamente era previo al escándalo de los esteroides y previo al escándalo del lío de acoso, de acoso sexual que hubo, que eso se reveló en Playboy. Eh, Vince era obviamente, pues, muchas personas hablaron mal de él y todo, y pues ahí cambió bastante. Pero el detalle es ese, siempre tuvieron, tuvieron una buena relación. You mentioned that pe certain people were not a fan of Jameson backstage. One of those names, uh, he passed away recently, and I'm talking about Pat Patterson. How was your relationship with Pat being the main guy holding the book in WWE? Oh, my God. First of all, you're very good at this. That's Thank pretty you. amazing what you're doing. I didn't understand much of it because I didn't hear no curse words. Um, <laughs> but No, but... Um, Yeah, Pat, uh, there, there, there's levels of my relationship with Pat that, you know, I don't want to, look, I, I, I felt a lot more comfortable talking about this while he was alive, but Pat, when all the talent would show up to the venue, Pat would be the guy that went around to each person, each talent to say what they were doing. And he would get to me and he'd be like, James, to go talk to Vince. Uh, you know, I don't, very dismissive. Like, I don't know what you do. Like, I, it was just, it, there was no secret that um, he was not a fan. Um, and You know, I think for a couple of reasons where Pat's concerned. Um, and I, it's, it's painful, me to, painful for me to talk about it because, you know, Pat in these documentaries that have been, you know, Pat was gay and I got a lot of gay friends. I'm not gay and I'm not. Um, there's times I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, but I think part of that was, uh, because of my character, um, first of all, as an old school wrestler, Pat Patterson, I know he didn't love the character, but also thought that maybe I was, I don't know. I wasn't, I so wasn't, I was so naive to it. I was totally, I'm totally heterosexual and I never, but. I think some of the guys that were his favorites um, think he was a bit, um, I don't want to say he was uh, I, resentful, might be a strong word, but he was not, I, I think he thought I was kind of cutting into his territory with some people. And I was, I didn't know at the time and, you know, Pat was gay or, or anything like that. And there was some talent, there was talent on the roster that for one reason or another, I got close with on a friendship, totally friendship level. Um, that I think, I think Pat questioned my sexuality and thought maybe I was, young you know me being young and him not being young and me being in really good shape cut and not really understanding that i wasn't that way that i was um cutting into his territory and the, and it took a a, a a production assistant that i had a, a good friendship with to pull me aside and say hey um yeah you know i know you You hang up around a lot with him, but you know, Pat's not good with it. And I was so naive. I had no idea. I was looking for, when I was on the road, I was looking for pot smokers who wants to go smoke a joint. And one of these, uh, there were two people basically I knew on that, that, you know, the two people that I really palled around with on the road where I didn't have to feel like I had to, I mean, these guys are all, 
you know, young studs that just when the show was over, they wanted to go out and party. And I wasn't that way. I was, I was most of their ages. I was um, 30 ish, um, which like most of the wrestlers, um, I just wanted to make the best of my time on the road. And it just so happened two people that I sought out or they sought out me to go around the building to smoke a joint. Um, one of them, the, the, it was a male and a female. And the male just happened to be, you know, one of Pat's prized possessions and just felt very threatened um, by me. And it, it made it even worse for me to try to deal with him. That's a lot to process. Let me translate this into Spanish. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah, that's a lot of information. Good information. Yeah, actually. I hate to. I hate to. I so hate to piss anybody off about like me. Uh, you know, I try to. I try to paint an accurate picture because that's what fans want. They want to know what was, and I try not to throw anybody under the bus. But that was, you know. Uh, it was just really hard for me knowing that he was probably at least in my impression was he was the guy that Vince leaned on most for talent coordination in terms of matchmaking and storylines and, you know, all the, uh, all the writers. And again, these were not writers writing dialogue. These were writers creating storylines for pat um it was it was it was it became like a no-win situation for me with pat yeah man let me translate this to spanish la relación con pat person no fue buena punto o sea su relación con pat person no fue buena traduzco porque esta falta es la que me toca eh John era una persona que le gustaba darse fumar su cigarrillo de marihuana la parte del hotel tranquilo con compañeros de la industria y había un varón y una muchacha que siempre fumaban marihuana con él uno, todos sabemos que Pat Patterson era gay y había uno de los compañeros de, de John quien fumaba marihuana con él, era uno de los tesoros más preciados de Pat Patterson él pensaba, según lo que John me dice, que John, Pat Patterson pensaba que John era gay y John no es gay, John es heterosexual él es straight, pero nuevamente lo veía de esta manera como que lo veía más joven, lo veía como una amenaza y las cosas pues realmente, vamos a decirlo de esta manera, Pat Patterson se sentía intimidado o amenazado por John y lo veía como una competencia porque pensaba que él venía a, a quitarle, vamos a decirlo así, su puesto, tal vez backstage eh, dentro de la industria, eh, tal vez nuevamente, o sea, por su orientación sexual, Pat pensaba que, que él era gay y pues la relación no fue, simplemente no fue buena. Before you went out of the WWF, there was a plan for you to go work with Hulk Hogan. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, no, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can, but I mean, it was just one conversation with Hulk that um, he wanted, there, shortly after the Royal Rumble, Um, there was going to be a Japanese tour, a uh, tour to Japan. And Hulk, uh, at some point during those days, said to me, you're coming to, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're coming to Jam yeah, Jameson, you're coming to Japan with me. And I was like, oh, shit. Because, you know, if, if he told me to, um, you know, jump off the roof, I might have. Like, that's <laughs> who he was. But. And I, and I totally respected his appreciation of me that, um, but when I, that, that was probably the first time I heard about the Japan tour. And I was like, I am not, I had a tap on, um, I don't know if I remember the Texas tour, Florida tour, tour. I wasn't a good flyer. And this is all before 9-11, had nothing to do with that. I had a panic attack on one of the flights and mean Gene actually saw what was going on. Came sat with me and kind of talked me through it and all this stuff. So the thought of flying to Japan and the thought of what 
other work I would be losing for that amount of time that I couldn't even audition um, leading up to those days I'd be on the road. Um, and that was it. It was one conversation. It wasn't like he negotiated or anything like that. It's the first I heard of it was Hulk telling me. Um, and I kind of started to prepare my speech to Vince that what could we do? How can I honor my contract and not travel anymore? It's um, so I, that's pretty much my answer. I don't, I don't, I keep going off on tangents, brother. I don't want to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like giving you a lot more than I'm giving you a lot more information than just the question you're asking. Me. No, but that's which great. is great. I love that. You're a great interviewer. And the fact that you could do it in two languages, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you, sir. Let me translate this briefly to Spanish. Había, hubo un rumor en mucho tiempo en las redes sociales de que, y en los websites de que Jameson iba a estar trabajando con Hulk Hogan. ¿Qué es cierto hay en esto? Pues Jameson nos contesta aquí que hubo una conversación, no hubo una negociación, fue una conversación en donde Hulk Hogan le dijo, oye, brother, hey, let me tell you something, brother. Te voy a decir algo, hermano. Vas a trabajar conmigo en Japón, en un tour que vamos a hacer allá. Y Jameson cuenta que en ese momento él no podía trabajar con los vuelos a larga distancia porque le causaban ataques de pánico, ataques de ansiedad. Min Jin fue la persona que se sentó al lado de él e intentó calmarlo, lo habló en el proceso para tratar de manejar la situación. Mientras Hulk le decía eso, John estaba por el otro lado preparando su speech, su discurso, para informar a Vince cómo podemos honrar mi contrato sin yo poder volar ni irme de tour, porque me está causando demasiada ansiedad. Y pues fue una conversación y no fue más allá de una conversación, no fue una negociación, fue Hulk Hogan diciéndole, y la única primera vez que, esto es lo que vamos a hacer, pero lamentablemente eh, no, se, no se pudo hacer. Man, let's go to what you're doing today, 2021, August 7th, uh, Gio's Restaurant. Uh, John, you will have your stand-up comedy once again. How do you manage to do this And still, you know, to still have the passion for what you do as a stand-up comedian after so many years in the industry, because people are, can be, you know, they can be really passionate about something, but after doing it for so many years, people get tired, but that doesn't seem to be your case. You really love what you do. Yeah, I got a great answer for that. Um, in the late 90s, maybe like five, four or five years after I left, WWF, um, I was, I was married. Uh, I got married during that time and married a woman that I loved very much who wanted to have a family. And, um, I, what, as an actor, even though I was able to support both of us, um, It was, I couldn't get a mortgage because my, my acting income was, you know, was so sporadic. It was one of these. It was like big one month, big. And banks were not good with it. The, they wanted to see contracts. They wanted to see. So I left the business, um, got a real job again. I had a financial background. I, and my thought was, I can always go back. Let me pop out a couple of kids, buy a house, and I could always go back to acting. And um, the speed bump in all of that was that my second born, my son, was just this kid off the charts that at three, I knew this kid was going to be a, a star, a child star. And Instead of myself getting back into acting, I coached him and he sure enough had a way bigger career than I, I had. Um, some big roles, some really, he, he was awesome. I mean, he, from the age of five, he was working right before his fifth birthday. He did a couple of Toys R Us um, spots. And then 
booked this unbelievable commercial with the NFL um, uh, with Cam Newton. I don't know if you're a football fan or not, but um, it was it was famous. Um, he was it came out on on Thanksgiving night, a Thursday night. No, Thursday afternoon. You know, there's three games on Thanksgiving Day, three professional games. It ran every game, uh, the commercial. And by Sunday night, three days later, it had two million hits on YouTube. It was just wow. huge. And if you Google Cam Newton play 60, Google that, um, you'll see why this kid became a star. And it had it wasn't until COVID hit that he was kind of shut down. But believe me, he was on Disney for three years, a main player on Disney. He did a movie that was up for an Academy Award where he had unbelievable reviews. He's only in two scenes, but one of the scenes is kind of famous with, with, um, industry people, casting directors and producers and and writers and um, that this kid um, this kid absolutely crushed that film. I mean one of the one of the um, a bit Chicago Tribune um, forget the writer but said that if this kid had one or two more scenes, he would have been nominated for Best Supporting Actor. He was nine at the time. And then he went on to um, play Kevin James, you know, King of Queens. He had a show um, for a couple of years on CBS called Kevin Can Wait. My son played Kevin's son. He was a regular. It was a very successful sitcom. Got canceled for... Um, not because of ratings, just because of creative differences. And but this kid was a superstar. But when when COVID hit, um, things shut down. I decided because I'm non-union. He's union. The only work during COVID was non-union. Um, I decided to go back and start auditioning again, and um, and that and. And then started creating these ideas for shows. Um, my son has been doing stand-up comedy in New York City and Long Island in professional comedy clubs since he's nine with adults, not like amateur nights or open mics, or he's been a book comedian at nine. He's 16 now. Um, it's a different world. He's still very much motivated and still gets a job here and there but until things open and him getting through that awkward stage of being a child actor to becoming an adult he's still doing great and he booked a gig on wwe extreme rules 2000 and i want to say 2014 it was at the uh, the Meadowlands in New Jersey. It was the featured match. Um, it was steel cage between John Cena and, Bray Wyatt. and the Wyatt brothers. And, and that Cena little kid boy, that sing. Yes, that's your that's son. My son. Holy shit! And you want to know the the greatest thing about this is <laughs> never that, imagined that. The greatest thing about this is that. He booked this through his agent. I had nothing to do. It had been so many years I was away from wow. WWF that he got this through his agent. And I'll never forget. We we go there. Now, I almost turned it down because it was a Sunday night and we had to get on a plane at like eight o'clock the next morning to go to LA because um, he was always working. Um, but I figured, hey, it's WWF. Let me WWE at that time. Um, yeah, let's do it. We'll 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 make it happen. Even if we don't get home till after midnight, 
we'll get up early, we'll do this. It'd be a great thing for us to have together, me and my son. And um, the, for me, the, what was a great moment in that night was Vince coming in, meeting James, getting down on one knee and explaining to him what he had to do. He had to hide under the ring. He had to, when the lights, they, somebody would let him know when to go up. The lights went down. He stood on the top step of the, the gate. And, well, you know the rest. I mean, you know what he did. But Vince explains this whole thing to him. And then he looks up at me because he's kneeling now. He's looking up at me and he goes, you must be his father. I said, yeah, Vince, do you, you recognize me? And he says, yeah, you look familiar. And I made the Jameson face, you know, like, which looked something like this. And he almost wept. He hugged me so tight. He wanted to um, bring me around to the people who 25 years later oh, were still there. It was, it was such a great moment. And maybe even a bigger moment was when, when we were shown the green room and the wrestlers, and you know how pay-per-view events go. Everybody's there. There were all, all big names. Um, and as word spread that that's the kid from the Cam Newton commercial, which was still running, um, wrestlers were coming to him to take pictures. And like the Bella Twins were all over him. They were, um, and I have some of those photos and I have, we, I actually, I'm not that smart all the time, but on, on our way, I stopped and bought um, the WWE magazine because I knew, having been there, that a lot of the people in this book are going to be there. And he went around, f- found their picture in the book, and went around and got everybody to sign it. And that thing's got to be worth it. A thousand dollars. I mean, it's it's uh, he, he even has the mask, the sheep mask that he wore signed by five of the wrestlers that were there that night. Uh, it's like uh, Bray Wyatt. Um, John oh Cena. God, John Cena definitely got signed, right? I don't I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. If it's the um, Wyatt family, Luke Harper, uh, Eric Rowan, Braun Strowman. Who's KKK? Who is who is that? Uh, uh, stay, I'm going to go get the mask. Stay right there. I'll wait for it. Vamos a traducir un poco en lo que él llega con la máscara. Mano, su hijo es el que salió en Extreme Rules haciendo el, el, la parte de He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. Él cuenta como Vince McMahon se pone en una rodilla a explicarle todo el proceso. Y se viene a decir, tú debes ser el papá. Eh, sí, Vince, ¿no te acuerdas de mí? Pues, caramba, es muy familiar. Y de momento se la cara de que hacía Jameson. Y Vince como que Jameson. Y va y lo abraza. Se reúnen nuevamente después de mucho tiempo. Man, that's the mask. Oh, my God. Ok, so it's... Uh, I see Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt. It's Ryback. Who was... Awesome. He loved the commercial, the Cam Newton commercial, and hung out with James, my son, most of the night. Like, really was a fan. And then here's this, this one. Can you see that? KK. Um, I don't, I don't recognize that. I mean, I'm not an autograph holder, but I mean, the Bray yeah. Wyatt, the Bray Wyatt got it immediately because that's his name. But that's yeah, huge. Yeah, this one. The nose. Man, um, I, I've never in a million years would have imagined that was guys. your son. I, I, I'll, I'll find out. But, um, you know, he was my heartbeat um, for from 2012. Uh, from 2012 to 2017. Those... 2018 um he did more his first year than he had more credits on a resume than i had in 20 years wow 
or, or not 20, 10 when I, when I gave it up. Um, but still just amazing. The whole Disney thing. And what was great was I, I get a lot of requests to go do these signings. I, I really don't enjoy them. It's, uh, it's kind of sad for me a little bit just because uh, you see guys that were, you know, pretty big names to, at some point um, selling their own shit and walked in with a cane or what and um, and I and making their own change with people, you know, like I do shows. I say, look, I'll stay in character. I don't want to touch the money. Here's what I want for the appearance. Um, sell whatever. I'll sign anything. Sell whatever you want. And um, and I realized at uh, WrestleMania in Jersey at, at uh, Giant Stadium, whatever they call it now. But that was MetLife Stadium, I believe. It's the stadium they have there. I think it was like 2013. Okay. Wherever WrestleMania, if it was in Jersey, we did a pre-show and I brought him with me, my son, because he was the Cam Newton kid and had him sit at a table, had eight by tens done um, with him and Cam. And, and he got his, he signed as many things as I did that day. And now I bring him to all the shows because a lot of the fans uh, um, that I've met have kind of followed his career. And, you know, a wrestling fan that has a daughter, might have a son, but has a daughter, wants to bring them to the show. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of these young girls, they're not into wrestling, but they hear James DiGiacomo from Disney, from Casey Undercover which was their biggest Des Disney show is going to be there. And he would, you'd see a line in front of him of dads holding belts and holding all their, their shit um, with their daughters next to them, waiting to go take a picture or, or uh, get an autograph from my son. And to this day, I still bring them. And he gets a lot of action. Man, let me translate. I was translating before. Let me continue to translate this. Go ahead. I'm sorry, buddy. No, man. This is, well, this let is me incredible. Go check my chicken. I think it's burning. Hold on. <laughs> Perfect. Do your thing. I'll do it. I'll do it. Él menciona algo importante y es que cuando él se va de WWF, en aquel momento, pues se casa con su esposa, muy feliz, consigue un trabajo fuera de la industria, le pone una pausa a todo. Y se enfoca más en la carrera de su hijo. Su hijo es actor, jugó desde que era nene, salía con Kevin James en series de televisión en Disney, sale en películas, sale en el, comercial de, en el comercial de Cam Newton, sale en Extreme Rules, por ejemplo, en WWF. Y me gusta ver esa dinámica familiar entre, entre padre o hijo, simplemente es hermoso. Como él dice, tener la oportunidad de ver a, sus papás, a un papá con todos los title belts encima para buscar la firma de los luchadores. Y entonces las nenas, oh, este es el nene de, de Disney Channel, voy para allá, como que crea esta dinámica familiar bastante bonita. Before we go to our last question, I wanted to thank you so much, man, for your time, for the incredible stories. It's been a blast for us having you as your guest. Last but not least, I was always mentioning, you are having a stand-up comedy in New York on August 7th. What can we expect from John? Not the not the not Jameson, the wrestler, but the comedian, the stand-up comedian that does that's been doing this for his whole life, basically. Yeah. Well, again, I I, I haven't been doing stand-up since Vince discovered me, mm -hmm. um, which is 30 years plus ago. A lot of time. Um, But I still, you know, I still can do a routine. I got some funny stuff prepared. My son, who is on the show as little Johnny, um, is going to do his routine. That's way better than my routine. We even kind of choreographed a bit of me as John, not as Jameson, introducing him. And then him introduced, then I go and get in character. And then he, he brings me on. Um, 
and we, we kind of choreographed this fight. It's really funny. It's it's just him kicking my ass, and um, <laughs> so it's like uh, it's five hours. It's I'm gonna say, well, the first hour, let's say fifteen. First hour of fifteen. It's four wrestling personalities doing maybe 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes each, um, including my, uh, my shtick as me and my shtick with my son. And then uh, Mario um, uh, is coming out. Mario, uh, he was a job, really funny guy, does st- stand up too. And then the headliner is Greg Valentine. And then after that show, the show part of it, we're going to do a Q&A with all four of us on stage. And then we're going to do a meet and greet where, you know, we're all at tables signing stuff. And and what really makes this a great night for wrestling fans, I think, besides, you know, very intimate uh, chance of going one on one with these personalities um, is. It's a three course gourmet dinner being served during the shows. Um, so it's from seven to, to midnight. Also, I found this tape. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but j- fairly recently. Yeah, I, I'm calling it Jameson, the lost episodes. And what it is, is it's on VHS. I've converted, converted it to digital. But what it is, is um me with a buddy of mine shooting um a concept for a storyline for vince to say after the royal rumble to say um uh it's basically the royal rumble the genius roughed me up and embarrassed me and all that so the storyline is that jameson joins a gym to get in shape to get revenge on the genius to kick his ass and it's hilarious it's like it's 13 minutes long it's it's really it's funnier than anything i ever did at the wwf even though it's shot with very low production value because it's on a super eight it's a home movie this is 1992 um still very funny and i broke it down into like three episodes this 13 minute tape and I released the first one about a week ago on Facebook. Hilarious. Um, And that's the setup for it. And what I'm going to do that opening night of this show that we're talking about is this, this room, which is gorgeous for this show is already set up with a projector and a big screen. I'm going to show the full 13 minutes in that that night um and i'm gonna keep releasing little bits of it but anybody that hasn't seen that first four minutes i encourage you to let's see how would you get it uh i guess i don't know if you have to join my my facebook page you have to friend me it's on my you know it's on my profile um if you go get it, it it's very funny and of the three episodes, it's probably the least funny. So I'm excited about releasing the other two. Man, I'm, let me translate this to Spanish. Eh, John va a tener un stand, va a ser parte de un stand-up comedy por primera vez en 30 años. Va a ser el 7 de agosto en Gio's Restaurant en Nueva York. Va a ser un sketch de cinco horas. Es, va a estar él, va a estar su hijo, va a estar Greg Valentine, va a estar Mario, va a haber un grupo de tal personas dentro de la industria de la lucha libre que van a hacer diferentes rutinas de comedia. En adición a eso, él va a premiar por primera vez un video de un sketch de 13 minutos que se había grabado anteriormente en donde él estaba como intentando unirse a un gimnasio para poder entonces eh, buscar venganza. Eh, y oirán, son historias como ellos proponiéndole a Vince McMahon son cosas bastante interesantes en Gio's Restaurant es el 7 de agosto en Nueva York échenle un ojo a esto, también él está disponible en Facebook, pueden buscarlo así mismo como John Jameson eh, Di Giacomo, ahí lo pueden enviar en Friend Request para poder ver un poco más sobre 
sobre esto, así que créanme, vale la pena cada segundo, tienen un Miran Grid ahí, van a tener un Q&A con los fanáticos, firma de autógrafos y todo, así que créanme, vale la pena todos los familias que estén en Nueva York, que estén en New Jersey, en Pennsylvania, en todo el Tri-State Area, dense la vueltita por ahí por Gio's Restaurant. John, it's been a pleasure to have you as our guest. I know uh, we've been, all, you know, we went a little bit of more of time, but thank you so yeah. much for everything, man. Yeah, all good, buddy. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. You're, you're, you're a total pro, really. Um, thank you, man. I, I've done a lot of the, well, not a lot of them, but I've done enough to say that, wow, this guy's got his shit together. Oops. Oh, I got to tell you one last story very quickly. Bring please. it on. Okay. When I was with the Bushwhackers, we were doing a promo for Spanish stations. And I don't remember the name of the announcer. He was great. He was very energetic and very, and, and you know, and Butch and Luke didn't speak Spanish. I only knew the curse words. I didn't know um, what we were doing. And we all stood there like grinning and, you know, while this guy's going on and on. In was Spanish, it, very was fast. It Hugo, was it Hugo Savinovich? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. But he was very entertaining, just physically, not even understanding what he was saying. Um, very visual, and very upbeat, uh, frenetic almost. Um, and he says this, gets done saying this long thing. And I, knowing, I took Spanish in school, but when he finished, I just reached stuck my head between the shoulders of the bushwhackers and said, punto. And which means period, like you're ending a sentence. After punto. he said all that, I just said, punto. And they cut. And you, they, 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 everybody say, you can't say that. That they, they thought I was saying puta. <laughs> and they said, we can't put that on the air. We can't. I said, no, it took me a while to explain. And <laughs> Whoever the announcer would say, no, that's great. That's funny. That's beautiful. Like, and then they, and they actually aired it as me saying punto, because I know the difference between punto and puta. Um, but that's a funny story, I think. <laughs> Let me translate this. Uh, <laughs> and in the Spanish, okay. John nos cuenta como cuando estaba haciendo un tour con los Bushwalkers, había un anunciador muy energético, que se veía gracioso. Eso sí era Hugo. <ríe> Estaba hablando bien rápido, bien energético, toda la cosa. Y John, con todo, se pone debajo de los brazos de los Bushwalkers y dice, punto. Period. Entonces, como que, corten, corten, corten. ¿Qué pasó? Ellos pensaron que dijo la palabra pregunta Pensaron que dijo puta, en vez de punto. Eh, y es como que, no, 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 tuvo que explicarle a ellos todo el proceso de que no era esa palabra, que era punto, que era period. Y es como que, ah, sí, bien gracioso, excelente, excelente. Y usaron la promo, pero casi eh, se mete en un lío en televisión latinoamericana. Man, this has been a really fun interview. Thank you very much for your time, John. Always wishing you success in your career and in your personal life. You too, life, buddy. Man. You, you, Thank you, 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 uh, Don't know where you are, it, where you want to be, but wherever you want to be, you're going to get there. Because you're just, you're a pro, bud. Man, thank you so much for your words. Really appreciate it. I'm humble, sir. And let's wrap it up in Spanish. Este fue John Digiacomo, anteriormente Jameson, en WWF y Michael Morales Torres para Lucha Libre Online, la marca número uno de Pro Wrestling y Combat Sports en español. Thank you for your time.